Well, we're finishing up our series on Refreshed, and um, it's been a good series, and I think that uh, uh, starting uh, next month, I think it runs for August and September, we're going to be studying out a book of Proverbs. And um, it's interesting that when Greg approached me to, to help him, and I certainly look forward to doing that, I, at one time I had over 2,000 sermons, and, uh, but I got rid of a lot of them. I think I kept my only last six years when I was up at Wesley, I kept those. So when I came down here and went to Brooksville first, I had my, you know, I had sermons, I was ready to go. And then when I came here, I thought for sure, you know, when Greg would give me the scriptures, I would have, out of 600 some sermons, I'd certainly have it in there. That's not the case. (laughs) I think out of the two years I've been here, I think I've used four of my old sermons. Um, and I looked up the Proverbs, all the Proverbs that he gave me, and I said, I've got to have some of those in there now, now. So I have to write all new sermons. But it's been fun, I have to admit. It's been fun getting back in there and doing it again. And uh, today we end up in um, our uh, scriptures out of Ephesians, the fifth chapter, verses 15 to 21. And the message this morning is under the influence of, and we'll fill in the blank the end. I think you'll be interested in what that is. But we're in Ephesians 5, 15 uh, to 21. So be careful how you act. These are difficult days. Don't be fools. Be wise. Make the most of every opportunity you have for doing good. Don't act thoughtlessly, but try to find out and do whatever the Lord wants you to. Don't drink too much wine, for many evils lie along that path. Be filled instead of the Holy Spirit and controlled by him. Talk with each other much about the Lord, quoting psalms and hymns and singing sacred songs, making music in your hearts to the Lord. Always give thanks for everything to our God and Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Honor Christ by submitting to each other. God's holy word to us this morning. In 1867, it's the year that uh, Jim Dunn was born. (laughs) 1867, the Swedish chemist Alfred Nobel invented a high explosive which he later on named dynamite. And he was convinced that his invention would make war too horrible to even happen again. However, he quickly discovered that there was no shortage of buyers for his new explosive. He made a huge fortune from his sales. Yet, he was horrified with the suffering and misery it caused in wars and conflicts. But what was he to do? What could he do? Toward the end of the 19th century, he awoke one morning to read, are you ready for this, his own obituary in the local paper. How would you like to start your day out like that? Alfred Nobel, the inventor of dynamite, who died yesterday, devised a way for more people to be killed in a war than ever before. He died a very rich man. Actually, it was Alfred's older brother who had died. And a newspaper reporter had confused the epitaph. But the account had a profound effect on Alfred. He decided he wanted to be known for something other 
than the man that developed the means to kill more people efficiently and for amazing a future and a fortune in the process. So as a result, he initiated the Nobel Peace Prize, an award for scientists and writers who foster peace. And Nobel said, every man ought to have the chance to correct his epitaph in midstream and write a new one. Wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that be nice? Well, the good news is we can. As long as we're still alive, we can correct our epitaphs and write new ones. We can always redeem the time that's left. And you say, well, okay, Reverend, how, how do we do this? How can I do this? How can I redeem the time that I have left to make the most of it? How can I correct my epitaph before it's too late? How can I ensure that the legacy I leave behind, for those who'll find it more faithful, how can I leave it behind a more positive one for my children and grandchildren? Well, let's look at the Scripture. It says, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making best use of the time because the days are evil. Literally, redeeming the time because the days are evil. We can buy back the lost and wasted time if we, one, live wisely. Literally, the text says, we must walk around as wise people. We must exercise great skill in the way we live. We must use good judgment. Richard Wiseman concluded that most people go through life so focused on the immediate task at hand, they completely miss other wonderful opportunities. And he gives a great example. He gives an example of a team of 3M researchers who were trying to develop a high-strength adhesive, and one of their attempts produced a product that actually was the opposite, a very low strength adhesive. Most of the team thought that the result was a failure. It wasn't any good. But one man saw it as an opportunity, and that adhesive failure went on to become the invention that made 3M post-it notes a reality. Don't be so focused on the problems. You miss the prospects for success. Don't be so focused on the mundane. You miss other good opportunities. It does us no good to whine and complain about our failures. Instead, let's live wisely so we can redeem the time that we have left. But in order to live wisely, we must, too, understand God's will. We must comprehend what God wants us to do. We must know his desire for us. And in our scripture, again, it says, Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. When we understand God's will, then it keeps us from doing foolish things. A wise life is a life lived according to the will of God. Tim Sanders, the former chief solutions officer for Yahoo, talks about establishing the right priorities. And he says, this is interesting, you ought to see if you could do this today. He says, take your life and all the things that you think are important and put them into one of three categories. 
And these categories are represented by three items. Glass, metal, and rubber. The things that are made of rubber, when you drop them, they will bounce back. Nothing really happens when these kinds of things get dropped. So for instance, missing a, missing a game or missing a season of football or whatever that is, it's not going to alter your marriage or your spiritual life. I can take them or leave them, he said. Things that are made of metal, well, when you drop them, they're going to create a lot of noise. But you can recover from the drop. You miss a meeting at work. You can get the cliff notes. Or if you get to balance your checkbook and lose track of how much you have in your account and the bank notifies you that you're, you're spending more than you have, that's going to create a little bit of noise in your life but you can recover from it. Then there are things made of glass. And when you drop one of these, it shatters into pieces and never be the same. Even though you can piece it maybe back together, it will still be missing some pieces. It certainly won't look the same. I doubt that you can actually fill it with water you know, because of the consequences of it being broken, and it will affect how it's to be used. And the thing is, you are the only person who knows what these things are that you can't afford to drop. More than likely, they have to do with your relationships, your marriage, your family, or your friends, and I'd like to add one that he didn't add, and I think it's the most important one, your relationship with God. Those are the things we must focus on because they are the most important things and they are the kind of things that are in line with the will of God. You see, when we put God's will first, then he takes care of all the rest. I always loved one of these beautiful sayings of Jesus when Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. In other words, all your needs will be met. So if we want to live wisely, we must understand God's will. And if we want to understand God's will, then we must three be filled with with God's Spirit. We must be controlled. We must be influenced. We must be directed by the Holy Spirit of God. Again in our scripture, and do not get drunk with wine, for many evils follow that path, but be filled with the Spirit. So God's will is very clear here. God does not want us to be filled with intoxicating spirits. He wants us to be filled with his Holy Spirit. Do not get drunk with wine, he says, which leads to recklessness. A few summers ago, in July, a Delaware man, I don't know if you saw this, but a Delaware man was preparing for a cookout on July 4th weekend. Only he decided to use gunpowder. Instead of lighter fluid to get his coals lit in the grill. Well, you know what happened. The whole thing blew, blew up on him. He suffered burns on his face and on his hands. And police said he happened to have been drinking. That's the nature of alcohol. It makes us feel good for a short while. But it ends up blowing in our faces. We have all known, and people will ask me, you know, when I go to the bar or whatever that's at the high point, and you know, oh, there's nothing wrong with drinking, is there, Reverend? I said, no, there really isn't. Too much drinking, yes. 
And I think we've all seen it, we've all been a part of it, or we all know of it, that alcohol wrecks lives. It wrecks families. It wrecks relationships. So don't fill yourself up with wine. Instead, fill yourself up with God's Holy Spirit. Let the Spirit of God take control of your life, not the alcohol. James Emery White, a seminary professor, and I love this illustration, when he was teaching on the concept of the Holy Spirit's filling, he would bring in two glasses of water and two packets of Alka-Seltzer to the class. And he drops a packet of Alka-Seltzer with the wrapper still on into one glass, and then he plops an unsealed packet into the second glass, and they all watch it fizz. And he says to his students, both glasses have the Alka-Seltzer, just as all Christians have the Holy Spirit. But notice how to have the Holy Spirit, they can have that, but not the feeling, not his feeling. What we want to do is unwrap the packaging around his presence and power of the Holy Spirit within. You see, it's not a matter of how much of the Spirit we have. As believers in Christ, we all have the Holy Spirit that we're going to get. He dwells in every follower of Christ in all of his fullness. So it's not a matter of how much of the Spirit we have, it's a matter of how much of the Spirit has of us. How much influence and control do we allow the Holy Spirit to have in our lives? Now tell me, what influences you the most? Is it alcohol? Is it work? Is it the pursuit of pleasure or power? Is it sports? Is it some radio or TV show that you just have to listen to every day? You see, you can be intoxicated by more things than wine. You can be intoxicated by power. We can be intoxicated by work. We can be intoxicated by the pursuit of pleasure. The only problem is when we allow these things to master us, they enslave us and eventually destroy us. Only the Holy Spirit can master us without enslaving us. On the contrary, When we allow the Holy Spirit to control us, he sets us free to achieve God's spiritual plan for our lives. In 2007, Julio Franco was 49 years old. He retired as the oldest position player in modern baseball history. That's a record that has yet to be broken. The year before, on April 21st, 2006, Julio Franco became the oldest player in Major League Baseball history to hit a home run. And just a week earlier than that, on April 27th, he became the oldest player in 97 years to steal a base. Well, retired outfielder Andy Van Slyke accused Franco of using steroids. But Franco's response demonstrated the true story of his remarkable life. Franco said, tell Andy Van Slyke he's right. I'm on the best juice that there is. I'm juiced up every day. In the name, and the name of my juice is Jesus. I'm on his power, his wisdom, his understanding. Andy Van Slyke is right, but the thing he didn't mention was the kind of steroids I'm on. So the next time you talk to him, tell him the steroid I'm on 
is Jesus of Nazareth. When we're juiced on Jesus, we can be all that God wants us to be. When we're filled with his spirit, we accomplish God's amazing will for our lives. And you say, well, Reverend, that's what I want. That's what I want. I want to be filled with God's spirit. I want to live under his influence and his control. How do I do that? Well, it's really simple. First, invite the Lord himself to take control of your life. Jesus said, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? If you want the Holy Spirit to fill your life, just ask him to. And then spend time listening to him, allowing his words to influence your thinking and your behavior. And we don't spend, the problem is, if we don't spend time with a person, how in the world can we ever be influenced by them? So it is with the Lord. If we don't spend time with him, then he has no opportunity to influence us. But the more time we spend with him, the more we're able to influence our thinking and our behavior. A teacher once asked her students to list what they thought were the seven present wonders of the world. And the students cast most of the votes for one, uh, Egypt's Great Pyramids. Second was the Taj Mahal. Third was the Grand Canyon. Fourth was the Panama Canal. Fifth was the Empire State Building. Sixth was St. Peter's Basilica. And seven was China's Great Wall. Most of the students were quick to decide. But one girl, one girl was having trouble with her list. And the teacher asked her about it, and the girl admitted that she just, I just can't make up my mind about the seven wonders because there, there are so many. So the teacher said, well, tell us what you have and, you know, maybe we can help. And the girl hesitated. And then she read. I think the seven wonders in the world are, one, to see. Two, to hear. Three, to touch. Four, to taste. Five, to feel. Six, to laugh. And seven, to love. Oh, my. When we can feel and laugh and love together, that truly is a wonder that far outshines any other wonder. And it's a wonder that comes only when we're under the influence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Amen.